Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me here, and, uh, and it's an, uh, an honour and an opportunity for that. For that. Um, I want to slightly change the, uh, the way I present today, because uh, uh, there will, will be some of the same material that you see online, but mostly all of my stuff is available on that blog spot, including this presentation, although if you wait for 24 hours, there's been some subtle changes, so it will be updated. Um, I've been a design engineer for 40 years and I'm just on the threshold of leaving design engineering to start another phase of my career called retirement. So you guys are all on the threshold of starting your careers and I guess an awful lot of you aspire to be design engineers so that really was an opportunity for me to look back and see what it was like when I started as a design engineer because that's what it was for you and it will also give you an opportunity to see the sort of things that have happened during my life as a design engineer because that's the sort of thing which is going to happen to you as well. So it will start then with a picture of me back in 1974 because that's when I stepped out of uh, the education system uh, I was 25 at the time, that's another and a separate story, I had actually left school 10 years earlier uh, but by that time I got myself a first in electrical and electronic and it had that word electronic in it and my aspiration, my aspiration was to be a design engineer. Um, and I did a lot of things which sound kind of familiar, mathematics, communications, physics, optics, electrical, discrete electronics, radio, digital logic, we were kind of playing around with computers in those days. Um, and Fortran as a, as a programming language. A lot of those things are still around today. A lot of them feel you wouldn't feel uncomfortable with. But I think you have to say, what was the state of electronics at that time? Because this is when I started, and in many ways, this is the background to the courses that I was being given. This is certainly the society that was around me. Most electronics was professional. There was pretty well no consumer electronics business beyond TV and radio. A uh, pocket calculator was just about coming out and the four function calculator was the one that you could get your hands on unless you were prepared to pay a lot of money for, for something from Hewlett Packard. <coughs> Larger companies had a computer and we shared that computer uh, by t uh, dumb teletypes. There's a teletype, that's what they look like, and that's how you got at it. And these were batch jobs, and you submitted two batches a day. That was the, that was the model. And so you did your, any simulations or any other work that you wanted to do, and believe me, like, they were fairly basic, because the I.O. mechanism was that paper tape. So you didn't have a magnetic tape or anything else like that. As you typed, you put holes in the paper, paper tape, and if you wanted to edit it, you ran it through the paper tape reader up to the point where you wanted to edit it. You stopped it, put in the new characters, and then continued again. It was pretty basic stuff. The car and the telephone were still electromechanical. There was no electronics in either. So look a little bit... Um, uh, before I look at a little bit more of those details, you can ask, was I really prepared for the next 40 years of electronics and what it would mean? Had, had my education been capable of making me into that person 40 years ago? So it's the question that you should be asking yourself, is your education now preparing you for the next 40 years? Because 40 years from now, I guess you'll be standing in front of audiences doing a similar thing. So, to put it in context then, this is what the inside of a radio looked like back then. I had one like this, I took it apart, I knew how it worked, I could adjust it, I knew how to design it, the whole damn thing. I knew what everything meant in it, that was a 7 transistor radio and it was quite distinct from a 5 transistor radio and if you really had deep pockets you might have run to a 9 transistor radio. You counted, you, you knew the number of transistors that were in your radio, you knew what they were doing but the thing about that is it's signal processing but the signal processing is analogue. The signals are analog, the processing was analog. That's what a car looked like back then. That was actually the car, not the car uh, the, that I had, because I don't have any photos of it, but it was the model of make of the car that I had at that time, and that's the circuit diagram of it. The entire circuit diagram, not the first page, just the entire circuit diagram. There's not a transistor in there, there's not a valve in there, there is nothing in there which passes as electronics. 
in fact, the radio was an extra. If you wanted to get a radio, then you went out and bought one and you put it in. And, uh, and about that time, there was a thing called a Heathkit car radio, which I built, uh, which had transistors in it, which was pretty revolutionary. And that's what the inside of a telephone looked like. We were making these in the order of a million a year for the company that I was working for at the time. But that's the entire circuit of diagram of the, of the uh, telephone. No transistors in it. Clever inductor here. Um, the uh, microphone up there is actually a carbon microphone, which is uh, a, a capsule of finely ground carbon with a diaphragm on one side of it. And you're measuring the change of resistance of that carbon capsule as it vibrates due to speech uh, and sound pressure. These are pretty basic things, but this again is, this, is the level of technology that, I was, that was in my environment when I stepped out of the university. And it looks pretty basic compared to what we're doing now. Now we have to, to go back and ask ourselves what being an engineer is all about. Because engineering is about creating stuff. And although we don't talk, I'm not talking here about electronics, I'm being very careful because that's, it's an intentional thing. Engineers are about creating stuff. Technology is a specific example of something that you can use to create that stuff. And electronics is just a technology. <clears throat> the thing that measures your success as an engineer is that what you make, what you design, what you create is valuable and viable. It's got to work, it's got to be economical, it's got to be producible, uh, it's got to be reproducible, it's not just good enough to make one, you've got to make large enough volumes to make this thing economically uh, worthwhile, and it's got to be innovative, it's got to be better than the competitive thing, whatever that may be. In one, in one respect, a slide rule was a thing which was used for calculating, I had a slide rule, I was using it in those days, um, and it was replaced by a calculator. Same function, different technology. Uh, so it's about delivering a promise, you've got to actually persuade somebody that it's possible to do the thing that you're proposing to do, and then you've got to live up to that promise. It's no use saying, well I know we got pretty close, actually by then your company is out of business. And so it's about using appropriate technology and technology which is actually available. So I couldn't have used embedded software, for example, until somebody invented the embedded computer. It would have been a technology ahead of its day. Uh, and that's not to say that these things don't happen, and I'll show you an example in a few minutes about when it did indeed happen. And it's certainly not about the pursuit of new or stimulation of your own pleasure ground plans. This is Business is about making money, fundamentally, and you can get a stimulating and exciting career out of it, but that's not the, object, the objective of business. So you have to remember that one, and I certainly have been guilty in the past of enjoying what I was doing so much that I forgot that this is actually in, uh, in the purpose of uh, trying to achieve business. Um, it probably limited my career. Anyway, so how long have designers been designing stuff? Well, actually, this is, this is the recognized earliest mecha uh, mechanism. It's not a machine, but it is actually a calculator. 2,000 years ago, Hyperacus and his Antikythera, I don't know where they found the word, I don't think it was carved on it, and I don't think it had a copyright symbol or anything else like that, but it was actually a calculating machine for calculating the position of the planets or predicting the position of the planets because it was fine to calculate them in the past but you needed to predict them for some purpose. They don't know what he had in mind when he was doing this but it was possibly something to do with navigation, it might have been something to do with religious cal calendars, who knows. Nevertheless it met a need. 2,000 years ago though pieces of metal were not easy to come by and so literally he would have had to get the metal get the metal made. He didn't have files, he didn't have machine tools or anything else like that, so everything about it would have been handmade. It would have been very expensive and there were not very many of them ever. It was nearly 2,000 years later, uh, 1700s, and it's an important date because 1750 is recognized as the, um, the, the, the date for the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was when the materials and the technologies available 
were able to meet a societal demand such that people were able, were, wanted to have them in large enough quantities to make it worthwhile to make these things and deliver them to the masses. In other words, it's when technology hit consumer and the consumer was very much a professional. But this is the same thing, and it was 2,000 years later that Graham produced his uh, orrery, again for predicting the positions of the planets. Now Babbage had this wonderful idea by 1837, because by now metals were pretty good and machine tools were pretty good, and, and Babbage was an academic, and he had this wonderful idea that he could make a calculating machine, and the calculating machine was to calculate tables. Um, polynomial tables were very useful before computers happened when you, do, when you had to do large calculations by hand and so tables had to be produced by hand they were produced by, generally speaking, uh, ladies who were precise enough about their mathematical, uh, mathematics to, to work out these individual numbers thousands of numbers which, which helped the calculation of, big, uh, 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 of bigger um, al algorithms so Babbage produced this difference engine, at least he produced it as a design, but the problem was he went beyond the capability to produce it. So although it could be produced and although it would have worked, actually the technology wasn't up to delivering it at the time. So he was a failure as a designer, so to bear that in mind, because it wasn't until around 2000, it does say on there somewhere, uh, constructed in 2000. It's in the Science Museum in London. Um, it, was it was only then that it was possible to produce gears accurate enough, although he specified it in his drawings, accurate enough to create a machine which was going to work. The big handle, incidentally, was the power supply. You had to provide power to this thing by turning a handle, not surprisingly. Not any electronics in there. Um, perhaps something a little bit more ingenious because we're now starting to look at a real algorithm is this wonderful piece of uh, mechanism, Amsler's planimeter, 1856. Again, they needed to be able to calculate the area of an arbitrary shape. They didn't need to know it precisely, but they did need to have a fairly good idea of what it is. And so solving that equation using that mechanism is quite interesting. You tend to think of uh, mathematics as needing a computer or at least needing large sheets of paper, but this was an interesting engineering solution because it doesn't give you exactly the area of that shape, but it gives it near enough because the, the product, the, the, the reason that you were measuring that was to do something which was at a higher level. You didn't need to know to the nth decimal place, you only needed to know approximately what its area was. It's so viable as a method that it's still in use today. You can buy modern versions of it. They don't need to calculate the angles and the areas using, uh, using gears and verniers, but they use it in the same, exactly the same approach. So architects will frequently have things like that in their suite of tools. Of course the computer doesn't look much like a computer today, but this is a valve implementation and of course valves, although they don't actually predate the transistor, were the first practical uh, devices which supported the activities of electronics. Um, this is a sto stored co program computer. By most calculations these days it could probably be replaced by something which you could get on a very, very small piece of silicon. Um, it's not sophisticated, but it establishes the principle. The point about this that I really want to get over is implementations which met a need have to be limited by the technologies which are available. So as a designer, your role is to look at the technologies which are available and create systems which are capable of satisfying a need. It's why I said, why I was particularly keen to emphasize that electronics is part of this, but it's not the only thing. And you're going to discover as you progress through your careers that things are going to change. So is this the face of modern computing? Is, it, is this the only area of electronics which is interesting? Well, I'll leave that as a question for a moment. Gordon Moore, 1965, he's, he's a, uh, he, him and I have a lot, a lot in common. I left school at 15 with no qualifications, it was a mistake, so it, it took me till 25 to get my first degree. Gordon Moore, on the other hand, at this time had just published his first law, well in fact his only law. 1965 is a, an article that went into Electronics Magazine. 
you all know what Moore's law is, I don't need to, re to repeat it, but what you don't often realise is that when he made that observation, he was designing ICs with 80 devices, not even 80 transistors, and he was basing his observations on the previous designs which he'd done at the 30 to 40 transistor level. So what sort of complexity are we talking about there? Well that, that's a three input uh, NAND gate whereas those are four two input NAND gates but nevertheless that's what 80 transistors or 80 devices looks like. It's not much. I mean that's the sort of thing that you do on a corner of a chip, you can sketch it out on a piece of paper and not surprisingly the simulation tool that was used at the time was that. You didn't need any more. But that's when he made his observations, that's what he was basing his observations on. Now the other thing he noted, if I can go back to it for a moment, go back, was that by 1975 we could be talking about 65,000 transistors on the chip, that's what he was talking about. So that's where I came in, integrated circuits are just about starting to kick off and uh, somewhere back down there that's the level at which I first started doing integrated circuit design. That's a story in itself but it's very different to the way we do it today. Now, coming a little bit closer to, uh, to modern day, here's a representation of his, of his law, and this is from a book, International Technology Roadmap for Silicon, 1999. You may ask why I don't use a more modern version of this graph, and the answer is they don't do this graph anymore. They stopped doing it. I don't know why, it's one of the most useful graphs they ever did. So you can extrapolate it up there to 2010, and with a little bit of uh, imagination we can come through to modern day. Now ARM happened about here. 1991 the concept of ARM came about and the context of ARM was integrated circuits of about a million transistors. Now a million is, you know, it's moved up from that 67,000 transistors to around a million. A million doesn't sound very many because of course today we're talking about billions of transistors and indeed this for the memory device here 20 billion transistors from in an integrated circuit which has got a selling price of five euros that's three pounds um, it's a lot of transistors for your penny a lot of transistors for your pound uh, but the context then of when ARM started a million transistors was about the biggest chip that people could afford to make to include in a product but it also means that in the 25 years since it's been around, there have been 20,000 times more transistors on a given piece of silicon than there was in those days. And that, those transistors go 10 times as fast. Now that means, at least in a uh, productivity concept, context, this piece of silicon is capable of being 200,000 times more, more functional than the, ARM, the integrated circuit that was available when ARM first started. 200,000 times you can't design a system using the same methods when you're talking about something which is 200,000 times more complex. Think about that. You can't just say, well, let's, here's one transistor, all we do is we'll repeat it 200,000 times. It's a much more complex system. And of course it doesn't stop there. This is the NVIDIA Tegra, Tegra 3 processor. It's about a billion transistors. Um, it's a few years old now, 2012. But it illustrates, and as you dig, dig deep into it, you realize, I'm sure you've seen the micrographs and, uh, and pictures before, but if you look down at this level, you see that there's three transistors. Three transistors of the billion that are in this chip. And the other thing that you should notice amongst that is that the transistors are not actually the biggest part of that. The complexity comes in how you connect them all up. Forget the chemistry and the optics associated with doing it. It's all very good, but in terms of a design, even if you're able to think about them as transistors, then you have to recognize that the connectivity is a huge part of it as well. And the reasonable estimates are that there's a further 100 times increased functionality in those chips because of the networking capabilities which are, which are introduced as well with multiple levels of metal and the connections together into more complex systems. So that's 20 million times more complex than it was in, in uh, 1991. 
So just to, to return a little bit to the business aspect for a moment. Business is about monetizing stuff. Don't underestimate that for a moment. If the business is not good at identifying things that people want to buy, and businesses are often not good at that, they're very good at making things which are exciting, but people don't want to buy them. And the other thing is doing it profitably. So if they can't make this thing at a, at a profit, then they won't stay in business for very long. So it becomes very important that, that those two factors are remembered. And you have to remember them because as a designer, you're keeping this company going. In a global market, which is what we face these days, all businesses are competitive with all businesses everywhere else. It was quite different in my early day. The UK was a big enough market for all of the companies. You had the, the opportunities to sell in the UK. You manufactured in the UK. It was a closed economy. The world has become global, and so you have to recognize that in business, you're in competition with another business which is potentially doing the same thing in Japan or China or the States or Europe, it doesn't matter. They're all within nanoseconds of, be of the same space and time where you are. <coughs> that does make businesses focus on their core competencies, which means you do what you're good at. You let somebody else do the other stuff. That makes you focus very much. Now it's their designers, and that's you, of all types, that create the product differentiation. Product differentiation is, is what it's all about. You've got a computer, here's one computer, here's another computer. You've got a phone, here's one phone, here's another phone. You've got a calculator, here's one, here's another one. The thing that differentiates them is the thing that makes people buy yours rather than the other one. And it can be technology that differentiates it, but it can be the color of the case that differentiates it. And they're all viable. And the designers are the way by which the technology improvements which are available are fed into the product. And the product is the thing that ultimately you sell to you and everybody else outside because those people are the ones that put money back into the chain to make it happen. And without the money coming back down the chain, none of this happens. So you may be working on research about some particular facet of, uh, uh, of chemistry or optics or anything else like that, but you only get money as long as your role in the product which goes out of the door is valued. Bear that in mind. It's important that you remain valued, which means you have to do a selling job to society to make sure that your role in the product which people value is appreciated. <clears throat> so it does end up, however, that product development is a risk and a cost to be minimized. Businesses aren't interested in product development, they're interested in product differentiation. They want to see their product being differentiated adequately so that people will buy theirs rather than, uh, rather than the competitors. So technology just enables alternatives, options. And it's the judicious use of technology which, make, which creates products which has got differentiation. New technology can introduce far more risks than it values. Companies which are in uh, dire straits um, often grab at new technologies as a way of hopefully staying afloat. It's a risky thing. Businesses which are stable seldom do. Businesses which are stable know how they're going to progress. They know that they mustn't over uh, commit themselves. They mustn't take risks which are too big and too uncertain. What it, what it actually means though is that reuse, reuse saves. Use as much as you possibly can from the previous product to carry into the next product because it's secure. It's comfortable. If I can take a phone and I can put it in a different color case then the, I don't have to change any of the risky stuff. I can change the color of the case, and if people start buying it because of that, then that's wonderful. That's what Apple does, incidentally. And it seems to work for them. <clears throat> but you have to remember that today's businesses have to be globally competitive money-making machines. May not be pleasant, but there you go. Now it's business opportunities then that drive technology. And back here in the 70s, the business opportunities were mainframe computers. 
But today, the business opportunities have gone up into the mobile internet and the internet of things. The volumes are huge. It doesn't mean to stay, say that the mainframe computer has gone away. But the thing that's driving technology development, the thing that's driving the market development, are those really big, high volume items right at the top. They give you the technology and the today's mainframe computers will benefit from those technologies because there are people who are still designing mainframe computers and they are using the technologies which are available to produce optimized solutions because they've got good designers as well. It also means though that the consumer, whereas it used to be a professional market down here in the lower volumes, is still a, a professional market, but the driver has ceased to be the professional market. It ceased to be people who know about technology and has become the consumer. And the consumer doesn't care about technology. No idea what goes on inside a phone. Only knows that the phone works. Only knows that it's sexy. Only knows that it's the phone to have. That's not really a good solution, is it? When we know how important it is to have technology right. But this is the, view, the face of computing today. Most of those things don't look remotely like computers, and yet they are. And then there's this other side of computing as well, and this is the, vis the invisible and vital aspects of it. You kind of live with a belief that your money in the banks is safe. I hope that you're never proven wrong on that. You like, your, like it that your credit card works. Uh, all of the, the security issues, the energy supplies, the navigation, the, uh, the, the security of being able to not only fly in a plane but be able to book in advance and, and go to wherever you need to go. There's a lot of technologies invisible which today are the driving force of computers. Now it's interesting to think about computer systems because when, it, when we think about a system we don't really think of the system at all. We think of the interface to it. Like when I go along to you, I see your face and I hear your voice and I don't think of your brain inside this shell. You know, I don't think of you as a, as a brain with some I.O. I think of you as the I.O. It's just the I.O. And the same thing here. These are complex systems, but actually our exposure to them is very much at a dumb interface level. You get a, you got, it's a human uh, problem or a human feature that you need to recognize. Society in a whole sees nothing below that interface. So our jobs, our role, our challenges, our funding, our, uh, our, uh, the thing that, we, that gets us up in the morning, the excitement of the challenge, is not going to be recognized by society and it's certainly not going to be valued by society. You've got to do more to sell that if you're ever going to change it. But society stops at that interface. It says, computing is being done. Microelectronics, well, that was done. All of these things have been done. They're, the idea that they're changing and evolving is just not getting through to, to the man in the street at all. So popping back to 1991, this is what ARM's original idea looked like. This is the, uh, the ARM risk processor core. I'm not asking you to, uh, to, to go through it. It's not a complex thing. You can find it in pretty well every uh, starting textbook on computer science. It's nothing, re nothing exciting at all. The exciting part was the business model. The exciting part was we will make this available for people to put on a chip. Don't forget this is around 50,000 transistors and you've got a million transistors on your chip in those days. That means you've got space to put some other stuff around it on the chip. That was the clever part. The business model was how we're going to make money out of that. So the concept was we make it into a, a virtual component. We didn't call it that in those days. We called it a Lego brick. And that was the sort of concept at least was a sort of electrical Lego brick which was used in the system. And that was one of the first chips that was produced using this as a concept. So you can see the ARM7 processor core and you can see the other pieces which were put around it along with a bus to connect it up. Now that represented a chip full in those days. Of course that was only a million transistors on a chip. A million transistors on a chip is a thousand times smaller, sorry 20,000 times smaller than we can do today. So you can imagine that the ARM7 core, and we still do something which is broadly like the ARM7 core at the moment, is 
half a square millimeter big today so it doesn't really take very much space on a chip now the other reason I like this graph was the red line the red line was the productivity graph and the uh, red line related basically to how many transistors an engineer a designer could put down in a day, unit, month, whatever it may be and it's essentially said that in the days of 1991 when ARM was starting it took about a hundred person years to put together a chip from a clean sheet of paper that was a manageable number, hundred person years um, the, if you see the, what was happening out on this side is although the EDA tools were getting better they weren't getting better fast enough and so there was this huge productivity gap which was building up. By today we'd have been looking at hundreds of thousands of man years to produce a chip from ground zero and you can't do that and so the thing that happened in, in that time oh the other thing that was occurring was another gap was coming up was verification because it was becoming increasingly problematic to, con to convince yourself that the thing that you created was actually the thing that was needed um, it was easy when it was only a, a quad two input NAND gate it's much more complex when it's a full system or subsystem component so what happened during that particular period of time was we were moving from single designer and that was me I remember designing my first chip on my own the entire chip and they're moving to a small team I needed a bigger group because I couldn't do all of it myself we still had poor simulation so we were managing through lo local teams through to global teams and that essentially meant that we had to move from clean sheet to some reuse to hardware and software reuse and expertise reuse which is where we are today it means though that the clean sheet design never happens anymore we just can't afford it without greater than 90 percent of reuse today's electronic systems would be unproducible so you can forget the idea of starting with a clean sheet of paper you're always going to be starting from work that other people have done you're going to be part of a group you're going to be working on a component or a sub uh, within a subsystem or if you like arm you're producing something which other people are then going to integrate into into uh, an integrated circuit to include other things around it as well you, almost nobody is involved with the product anymore everybody is involved in the life cycle of it so designer productivity will, became the driving um, motivation for a whole lot of this period of time um, and it, all, it was the only way to realize the necessary productivity with, from reasonable teams in reasonable design periods and at reasonable costs <coughs> clean sheet approaches though still poss possible are just huge orders of magnitude more expensive to do which is why in general they won't happen so what does it mean to the ARM model so that simple single um, uh, CPU core at about 50,000 transistors is still here we still have one but we also have other cores which are 50 million transistors so a thousand times bigger and we also have them in ways that it can be incorporated not only as single CPUs but as multi CPU clusters and we also have the DSP, the uh, coprocessors, not coprocessors, the, uh, the, the digital signal processing cores which are again general purpose processors but aimed at signal processing as opposed to uh, general computation that means that we have 24 processors in six families available inside ARM these days so this model of just one CPU which, is, uh, which goes out there is a model which had to evolve and during its 25 years has evolved quite a lot but not only this, the processors because it's no point in having the processors you've got to have a way of putting them together so this is a typical system that we provide as an example that people might want to implement in their future products this one has got four clusters of quad core processors each, each of which is five million transistors big uh, you've also got the opportunity up there on the, uh, on the right for the uh, DSP processors, the Mali suites and then of course you've got scope for how other people can connect their blocks together and of course that's only giving you the integrated circuit that's not giving you the system 
So you also have to have the, uh, the software, the drivers, the OS ports, the tools and the utilities to help people to actually create systems out of this by reusing as much as they possibly can operating systems, the software they wrote themselves in the past, the other components and peripherals that go together with it. So an awful lot of what still seems to be ARM, so ARM still is known as the company that produces a CPU and sticks it down on a chip, a lot of what ARM is doing has changed hugely. That's 200,000 or 2 million times bigger number, however you care to interpret it. It's something that we're still benefiting from. We are still developing our technologies and our methodologies ourselves because we have to be able to sell those to our customers and they need them because they need the productivity. And as Moore's law continues to evolve, then that productivity requirement will continue to evolve. And the business model. We need to have a business model. This is a, a model, the slides are here, you'll be able to look at them and read the detail afterwards. But it takes time. It takes two to three years before people have incorporated the concept into their next product. Two to three years for them to take and develop their chip based on the knowledge that we have given them, sold them. And it then takes, it may, the, the product may run for as long as 20 years. We have ARM designs which are still in the market today, which are 20 years old. They show no signs of going away. There may be a great deal of repackaging going on on the outside around them, but we are still supplying them and, and we're still getting royalties from it. The thing that's innovative about this is a shared cost business model. We don't, we don't take all the money up front. What we actually do is we give people the opportunity of licensing, that is paying a fixed amount in the beginning, and then a royalty basis, which means that when their product is successful, they give us a little bit of money for every one that's shipped. Now that makes us, that gives us skin in the game from their point of view. They know that we're interested in getting the product out and successful. And because of that, if there is any difficulties, they know that they've got our attention. We will help them to make it work. It turns out to be a very good business model. Uh, so we've shipped to date 60 billion, well actually the very latest number which came out yesterday, which I can tell you now, is 70 billion. We shipped another 10 billion last year. Yet we don't make anything. Our partners have shipped all of those ARM CPUs on our behalf. To you, essentially. Everything which is smart these days, which is, or most of the things which are smart these days and surround you, are ARM powered in one way, shape, or form. And yet we don't make the um, smartphones, we don't even make the chips which are in them, but our IP goes into those chips the software development tools, the physical bl uh, blocks, the cell libraries, the processor and graphics IP. Um, and a lot of applications and software support tools, um, the design environments, the modeling environments. People want to make architectural choices about the sort of systems they need to develop. They need to understand if they make the, if they make the memory 8 or 16 or 32 bit wide, does it give them bottleneck problems? And that kind of architectural decision, we help them to make again by provi providing tools. The essential, the essential thing being that when they do produce a chip, it works and we have a very enviable record these days because it's so expensive to produce a chip anyway uh, that more than 90 percent of the chips that we work that we are involved in work first time and most of them need only minor revisions before they become production items and to, for them to work first time is quite an achievement so we enable innovations and that's the thing that that's important we don't make anything but we help people to make innovative products our components, our methodology has to be innovative to do that because otherwise they would buy it from somebody else who is. So we're in competition with other providers of CPU and similar technologies uh, and we are only in the products that we're in because our products remain innovative. So it's important that they stay innovative. Now back probably now to most of your time as well because you're so used to be able to, to, to seeing the things in front of you, it's a human characteristic I think, to think that they've always been like that. So I'm bringing this back to your time scale because this is only 1998, 17 years ago. So most of you I guess are older than that, I don't know if we've got any geniuses here in the audience who are younger than that, but uh, maybe not. You probably don't remember 
but I think if you try hard you will. This is what a camera looked like very recently. Excellent lenses, fine mechanical mechanisms, so shutters were mechanical mechanisms. Uh, electromechanical exposure, so it, the, the uh, metering in there was a, a mechanical system, um, a photo cell driving a meter. The meter needle was actually pressed in a, in a certain position and that was used to determine the shutter speed. Um, metal and plastic forming, pretty unsophisticated by today's standards wouldn't you think? I mean that doesn't look like a, a high quality piece of kit but it was a Canon camera, it was a good camera. Manual assembly, I mean how, how do we think of assembly as part of a product but it is. And a photochemical memory. It's quite a thing to translate the universe, the three-dimensional universe to a two-dimensional plane and save that information. We mustn't underestimate the huge achievement that a lens is and a film was. It's a marvellous idea. We still do the same thing today. So here is a, a modern camera and it still depends on a lens. There are some ideas being passed around about lensless cameras. Um, they're not there yet but it's possible to do so. Um, and it still provides the same thing. It is a mechanism for enhancing human memory. And the technology still has excellent lenses and displays. Um, and it still involves precision forming of plastics and metals, but actually I think you'll agree it looks quite a lot better these days than it did only 18 years ago. But look at all the other stuff that's made an appearance here. There is the computer to start with. It's in there. You don't see it. It's an arm. Um, but there is... Uh, analog electronics, network and networking and GPS, a lot of the cameras know where they are these days so when you take a picture you're not just taking a picture you're also recording where and when. Uh, sensors, CCD and MEMS devices, precision mechanics, most of these things have got autofocus lenses with micro motors. Um, the batteries and, en and, and energy storage have changed hugely. We, they've got batteries, I mean principally they, they had a battery in there before but that was only for the meter, a tiny thing. Um, LEDs and discharge tubes, precision form plastics and metals, electronic packaging and we mustn't forget robotic assembly. The manufacturing process has become an important part of these products although it doesn't appear in the bill of materials. There is nowhere a line item that says the manufacturing process. This thing needs robotic assembly. It cannot be assembled by hand. Hand isn't fine enough, isn't manipulating enough. So these things are important because they're, they're an important part of the products that we're producing. So all of these technologies are available today. So I mean these are available on the open market. So why couldn't ARM for example go into making cameras? Well the answer is that although the technologies are available they're not incorporated into the business. So the business has to be able to use the technology which means the technology has to be incorporated into the business in a ready to run form. And that's important because just because it's out there doesn't mean to say the business is capable of using it. So Canon has been a remarkable company because they've done this, translate, this transition from a very mechanical and photochemical world to a microelectronic digital world and they're still a leading camera brand. There's an awful lot of uh, businesses out, of the, out there such as Kodak who had cornered the market, who knew how to make cameras and they've simply gone. They thought that the money was in film and that the camera was just a way of selling film. They've gone. So there are other virtual components in, uh, in all sorts of electronics. So here's the smartphone and you can see them. I'm not going to go through them by. But manufacturing and reproduction and robotics and test are major parts of the product. But the thing about all of these are that they are virtual components. They don't appear on the physical list what's called the Bill of Materials. The Bill of Materials identifies all of the individual parts which are put together in the final assembly. So the integrated circuits, the discrete resistors as opposed to the ones that are printed, the printed circuit boards, they're all physical components. But increasingly today modern products have a very large quantity of virtual compo components in them. 
Apple identified this back in uh, 2011 when they were driven to identify their primary suppliers, what they call their tier one component suppliers, and they had identified 160 tier one providers. So they're the, the, the ones who are literally the last people who are supplying components before they incorporate them into their products. It's only in the tier two suppliers when we start to include the virtual component suppliers that we find the armies on the list. And there's a, a roughly ten times the number of those virtual component suppliers than there are tier ones. So that's around one and a half thousand companies are supplying uh, Apple with uh, virtual and, and physical components. So we're getting close to the end in many ways, and I'm getting close to the end because it's at my finishing line. Um, I've already semi-retired and I guess I'll fully retire before the end of the year and that means that there has been an awful lot of changes and I've learned an awful lot of stuff and to go back to that first question how was I actually prepared for all of this stuff that happened in 40 years? Was my education a total waste of time? And the answer was no it wasn't a waste of time because the thing that my education provided was a basis for me to enter this race. This race that I'm now reaching the end of, end of has all sorts of things in it that it didn't have when I started. But I was prepared for it. I had the mindset, I had the basic knowledge, I had the basic uh, uh, equipment that I needed to, be, to start to be a design engineer when I went out there into the universe. But the decision about um, what I did the evolution about what I learned was a continuous process that happened throughout that entire 40 years. I was never going to have been prepared for all of these changes that could have happened, no matter how good the university I went to. I had to do that myself. I had to coordinate that myself. I had to steer the path of my career myself. There isn't a career as a design engineer that you step into. And you're not God's gift to engineering when you step out there either. You're only a beginner. So being a design engineer then, the journey of a lifetime. Business values ability over the way that it was achieved. So we've, said, we've already said that business is very pragmatic. What matters is what you can do, not how you got there. Um, there may be some areas of life where that isn't the case, but certainly in this technology area it, it is. Uh, it enables you a good education, a good tertiary education, enables you to understand the language and the context. It prepares you to take the next and subsequent steps yourself. The knowledge, ability, adaptability and quality should be the things which you do learn in university. Certif certificates matter, but not as much as ability does. So it's, it means that being a design engineer is a through life experience. You have to adapt yourself because you want to have a career. But the company needs you because its abilities depend on the assembled abilities of the team of design engineers that it has. And those design engineers work, work on the knowledge that they've got, but also as part of a team. Uh, a good designer, therefore, is able to connect his or her personal knowledge and experience with that of, that of others. And again, to deliver innovation. Delivery is the primary focus. It also means that you can think that it's only the last three to five, three to five years of experience that you have that matters. And to a certain extent that's very right. But the, 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 the fact still remains that you wouldn't have been there if you hadn't had the history that you will have had. So your education is enough to get you to the starting line and the work that you do in the next three years, three to five years, is enough to keep you in that race. And the, and the three to five years after that, enough to keep you in the race as well. It's continuing. It's not the end of an education, it's the start of an education. So the education system doesn't produce engineers and scientists, only produces people ready to become them. So are you ready for this? That's a good question. It's exciting, believe me. I would not have chosen a, another career. And the scariest thing about retiring is the prospect of having to stop being an engineer. And that's scary. In many ways, I don't know how to do that. I've spent 40 years doing it. 
ARM starts with good graduates and expects to develop them. So most modern companies will expect that they're going to have to help with training their engineers. They need you to be trained. They need you to develop your skills because they need your skills in their next products. They, they are, a good company recognizes that. A poor company will simply exploit what knowledge you've got and then throw you away. Because they're not bothered about your career development, that's your problem, not theirs. So be very careful when you choose the company that you go to work for. Ask them about their career development prospects. Because it's not them that, they're, that are going to benefit from your career development, it's you. So then, conclusions. Not too bad for time either, that's breaking with tradition. Um, electronic systems are the most technically complex machines ever made by man. This is wonderful, wonderful stuff that we're doing with here, dealing with here. And it's not just Moore's law, it's this whole imp imp impetus behind the business. Increasing complexity, increasing sophistication, use, increased use of and availabilities of technologies. And designers, like you, are going to be bringing this thing together and making products out of it. There is nothing more exciting. It's endlessly challenging. And it, every year it will continue to be so. Moore's Laws had a good run for its money, and it may actually have started to run out as far as planar silicon is concerned, but there is no chance that system complexity is slowing down even a, even a jot. Business drives everything, don't forget that. Whenever you try to il illustrate everything, whenever you try to do anything, think how it's going to affect the business. Because if it affects the business, then you get the pay rise, you get the company cars, you get the recognition and you get the, the departments because the business wants to exploit your ability to do something good and useful. There's no prizes for making it work, so just making it work is what you're expected to do. Making it better than that is what makes you different. So design in an era of rapid change. The 21st century will be no different to earlier eras. It's been exciting from 2,000 years ago. There is every chance that it will continue to be exciting. There will be technologies in the next 40 years we literally know nothing about today. But you, with your mindset, will make that progression over the next 40 years. You'll look back on this and you'll say, my God, was it really as basic as that? When I, when I came out of university. So, you've chosen a wonderful career path, and I ex seriously expect you to have a great time doing it. Don't think about it as a one-off. Think about it as the start of a race, and enjoy the race. That's all I've got to say. Thank you for listening.